much. So, um, so that's the last talk before dinner, so I'll try to be as concise as possible. It's not my greatest quality, but I'll do, I'll do my best. Uh, so I'm going to, okay, here is a brief, does that work? Yeah. So here is a brief outline of my presentation. So I'm going to talk about mostly two things about agency first, which refers to the sense that you're in control of your own bodily movements and through these movements or actions of uh, events in the external world. I'm also going to talk about action selection, so the process of selecting or choosing an action between uh, action alternatives. And I will provide <coughs> experimental evidence and for their interaction, for the role of these action selection processes in developing a, a reliable uh, sense of agency. And I'll try to show that this may provide new insights into the notion of uh, the notions of causation, delusion of control, and expertise. So I'm going to start by saying that the agency is really about causation. Uh, agency implies a general sense of internal or intentional causation, so the sense that I am the cause of a movement performed through my own body, and the sense that this movement is the cause of uh, an event ex uh, occurring in the external world. So here, raising the arm and causing a taxi to approach, but it also works if, uh, with external device. And if you think of turning on the light, you press a switch, and uh, shortly after pressing the switch, the light turns on. You should normally and consider yourself or experience yourself as the cause of the light uh, going on here. And uh, of course, agency and causation, so they share some obvious similarities, but they also share the same problem, and they can't be directly perceived or experienced, and you can't directly perceive uh, the generative uh, process and connecting the cause with the effect or the internal process and connecting, sorry, the action with uh, its external consequences. And this is something that echoes on the old Jungian notion that because causation cannot be directly perceived, uh, people use other cues and to infer or reconstruct causation, such as, for example, noticing that in the external world, uh, uh, some uh, events regularly covariate. And so people would simply uh, uh, reconstruct causation and direct, rather than directly experience causation or directly perceive causation. So would simply reconstruct causation based on noticing these uh, regular covariations between external events. And this idea that uh, causation is uh, reconstructed uh, rather than directly perceived or experienced is something that finally resonates uh, with maybe the most influential uh, account of agency these last two decades and the, the so-called comparator account, which I show here in a very uh, a crude, oversimplified version. So very briefly, uh, uh, on this account, uh, it is assumed that we have a limited conscious access to uh, online motor programs and to the various computations uh, performed during uh, action preparation. So we can't form any memories of these uh, various computations, for example. And for this reason, the only experience we can make, or the only thing we can explicitly report uh, about uh, 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 our own action is based, or should be based, on the external consequences of action. So uh, in this model, uh, agency would simply be the output, the experiential output of a late process and comparing uh, the external actual consequences of action with predictions uh, made by the motor system during action execution. So uh, uh, when these predictions are satisfied, when I got what I expected to get, I should normally feel uh, in control of my action. I should normally feel responsible for the consequences of this action, and uh, conversely, in the case of a, a prediction error. And so you can see that in this model, agency has a very strong retrospective component, and because you, you, you can't have agency until you get the action feedback. So you need to wait for this action feedback to make the comparison, and based on the result of this comparison, then agency is uh, back-propagated. Uh, agency is retrospectively uh, attributed to the, to the action made. So in this model, and there is no real internal marker of agency and nothing arising from within the action processing chain that would be experienced uh, as such uh, in real time. And uh, this idea that uh, agency is only computed post hoc post-action and retrospectively attributed is something that we tried, that is the idea that we precisely tried to challenge and with, with, with Patrick a couple of years ago in collaboration with Doris Wenke and, and uh, Steve Fleming as well. And the idea that we uh, progressively developed is that you don't necessarily need to wait for the consequences or to know the consequences of action to experience control over this action. 
sometimes at the point of uh, 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 selecting or preparing the, act the action, so even before making the action, and we, some, we, we already know what to do and how to do it. So sometimes you already know what action to select huh, to uh, get the right outcome. So there are situations in which uh, uh, the choice is easy to make, action selection is completely fluent, and we made the hypothesis huh, that uh, maybe the feeling of this feeling of fluency or disfluency during action selection and before making the action may prospectively, uh, may pro prospectively influence uh, our sense of agency irrespective of the consequences of action, irrespective of whether the consequences uh, are as predicted by my uh, internal model. So what we were looking for here is uh, something like a, a feeling of doing, yeah? a prospective feeling of doing, of doing, that would be somehow analogous to the metacognitive uh, feeling of knowing, but in the action uh, domain. And to test this prediction, we designed this uh, two AFC uh, uh, task in which we just manipulated the fluency of action selection by making it easy for people and whether to select a left or a right uh, button. So. Uh, here is the task, it's a very simple task. So people had to indicate the direction of a tar uh, left or right pointing target arrow by making a left or right key press. Then after a varying delay, they saw a color patch and there were actually different colors, but I, I skipped this for the moment. And at the end of the trial, they were asked to estimate how much control they had over the appearance of the color patch. So to estimate how much control they had over uh, what appears on the screen as a result of their button press by using a scale from one to eight, one no control and eight uh, absolute control. And the critical variable in this task uh, was a subliminal prime, a very short left or right pointing arrow that we inserted just before this big uh, supraliminal target arrow. And we had two uh, types of trials, Compatible trials in which prime and target pointed to the same direction, make, making selection easy, and incompatible trials in which a prime and target pointed to opposite directions and making the selection uh, difficult, harder to make. So we had two types of primes. Uh, so the primes could either help uh, or prevent people from selecting the uh, right button press, and we wanted to see uh, whether uh, just making the selection of the button press easy or difficult, fluent or disfluent, already gives you a prospective sense of control uh, over what appears next, uh, despite the fact that in this task, uh, compatible priming compared to incompatible priming doesn't give you any additional control uh, over what appears on the screen uh, as a result of your button press. And uh, yes, and here are the results. So what we found is that so when people are compatibly primed, they respond faster to the target and then when they are incompatibly primed, that was expected, but they also experience higher agency uh, uh, over what appears on the screen after pressing the button in this compatible uh, fluent trial and less agency, less control in the uh, incompatible disfluent trials. So we found that subliminal priming facilitates action selection and uh, boosts perceived control over effects of action, despite the fact that in this task there was no real instrumental control, no causal relationship between the action made, or no real causal relationship between the action made and the outcome itself. So just by manipulating the fluency of action selection, just by making it easy or difficult uh, to select a, a, a response to a target, we are able uh, to modulate the uh, control, the control experienced by a subject over their action and the consequences of their action. And the other critical point is that this effect of selection fluency on sense of control uh, is prospective rather than retrospective because the locus of the priming effect necessarily precedes uh, action execution, necessarily occurs before making the action and knowing the consequences of this action. But there was one potential issue uh, with, this, uh, with these results, and this <coughs> issue stems from the fact that in this task and there's an apparent apparent relationship and between response times and sense of agency. So people, now when, when they are compatibly primed, they uh, uh, experience higher agency, but they also respond faster to the target. So it might be that when people are compatibly primed, they experience more control, not because of increased uh, uh, fluency of action selection, not because they uh, prospectively monitor their uh, these premotor fluency signals, but just be, be, because they retrospective, uh, retrospectively judge their uh, own motor performance during the trial. And they would simply retrospectively judge uh, their own response times uh, while uh, uh, performing the task. 
And we know that people are very good at introspecting their own response times, even at very short uh, time scales. So in a, a follow-up study, study uh, we uh, try to control for that by dissociating sense of control from uh, response times monitoring. Uh, and to do so, we use a procedure uh, that is known to reverse the relationship uh, between priming and uh, uh, response times. And this procedure simply consists in slightly delaying the onset of the target so that, so that now uh, response times are slower following compatible priming and faster <coughs> following incompatible priming. Why is that? Uh, simply because when the onset of the target is delayed, the motor potential uh, uh, here initially induced by the prime is uh, not confirmed uh, by any additional uh, evidence uh, such as a target. And because this confirmation does not occur uh, or is slightly delayed, but this initial uh, potential is, uh, is automatically, automatically inhibited by the system and uh, this uh, potential ends up uh, be, be below the motor activation level, so basically it's cancelled and the other competing uh, potential uh, eventually wins the competition. And the resulting difference in uh, response times is called NCE you know, for negative compatibility effect, where incompatible priming uh, paradoxically leads to faster response times than uh, compatible priming, yeah. And so we, we ran this task again with adding this uh, delayed uh, condition, and we found that indeed uh, increasing the delay between prime and target um, uh, induces a cost on uh, response times, uh, so that now people are slower to respond to the target when they are compatibly primed, but their subjective control remains unaffected. So they keep feeling more in control in this uh, fluent compatible condition despite uh, slower response times. So these results, they suggest that, that there's a clear dissociation first between mechanisms responsible for this negative compatibility effect and mechanisms responsible for this prospective influence of selection fluency on a sense of control. Uh, and people, now we are quite sure that they do not retrospectively judge their uh, response time, their motor performance during the trial, or at least that the effect we found uh, is not due to people retrospectively uh, judging their motor uh, performance. And because this effect of selection fluency uh, is not affected by this late auto-inhibitory mechanism leading to the uh, negative compatibility effect, compatibility effect but this effect of selection fluency must necessarily occur before this auto-inhibition stage. Huh? So uh, here, the, during this uh, early action selection phase, and uh, might depend uh, on signals generating during the early, so this early phase of action preparation. So these results, they are interesting to me because they tell us something about the locus of uh, this effect, uh, where this uh, interplay between selection fluency and sense of control is somehow elaborated. And it's very, very early in the action processing chain. So now to, to, to localize more precisely this effect and to better uh, understand the nature of the mechanism and leading to this effect or underlying, underlying this effect, we did a second, uh, fMRI st uh, a second study using fMRI. And in this study, uh, we <laughs> focused on this um, action selection phase uh, in the trial where people are selecting which action uh, to make. And we found two things. First, we found that this fluency of action selection, so mismatch between prime and target, uh, specifically recruits the dorsolateral part of the prefrontal cortex. Huh? So here the DLPFC seems to be, um, uh, seems to code for this uh, subliminally induced conflict and prime target conflict at the time of action selection. And uh, secondly, we try to estimate how much variation in brain activity at the time of action selection was predictive of control ratings made at the end of the trial. And to do so, and we took these uh, control ratings and we used them as modulators of brain activity at the time of action selection. And we compare the modulation between compatible, fluent, and uh, uh, incompatible disfluent trials. And we found this nice parametric interaction in the angular gyrus. Huh? So it's a region uh, located in the inferior part of the uh, parietal lobe. And this interaction looks like this. So in X, you have each person's control ra uh, uh, ratings huh? uh, split into three different uh, tier types of control, low, medium, and high tier types of control. And you can see that when selection is fluent huh? uh, in, in compatible trials, uh, activity in the angular gyrus does not vary at all. Huh? The angular gyrus does nothing related to control, which fits quite nicely with the idea that agency is the default experience, is the baseline experience, 
uh, we normally feel in control of our actions and there is no need to specifically code for this default experience of control and for this baseline experience. So when uh, this is me, no coding by the Angular gyrus, but when the selection becomes uh, this fluent, and when I'm thinking left and I get told to go right, uh, the Angular gyrus shows a strong deactivation and this deactivation is a function of how much control uh, uh, I feel uh, over my action. So here the, the angular gyrus huh, <coughs> gets progressively deactivated or progressively returns to baseline as I feel more and more control over uh, what's going on. So these results, they suggest uh, that the normal function of the angular gyrus is to code for this is not me, huh, to code for lack of agency, for lack of control, rather than for positive feeling uh, of uh, control. And uh, also suggest and that this function of the angular gyrus is uh, already present at the time of action selection. So there is nothing retrospective here. Uh, the angular gyrus uh, codes, prospectively codes for uh, 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 agency uh, before you've even made uh, the action and uh, before you, you, you've even pressed the button. And, uh, and finally, in looking at the connectivity between these two regions, we found a strong connectivity between so the angular gyrus and the DLPFC when selection was uh, disfluent only, so this is the blue line, and no communication at all, and no exchange of signals between these two regions uh, when the selection is easy or fluent. So this is the red line, so this connectivity and this uh, exchange of signals when selection is disfluent suggests that uh, the angular gyrus uh, uh, monitor signals relating, relating to uh, action selection or to disfluency of action selection in DLPFC to prospectively uh, inform subjective agency and to prospectively inform judgments of control over uh, effects of action. Or to say it differently, and the angular gyrus would monitor these objective signals of action selection to, um, so would convert these objective signals into a subjective uh, format, into a subjective experience of control or lack of control. So of course the uh, fMRI measure is only correlational and the evidence provided is uh, only indirect. And so to get a more causal direct evidence uh, of this, uh, for the, the role of the angular gyrus in prospectively coding uh, agency, we did two um, follow-up studies using uh, TMS. And these, these two studies, they also allowed us to make sure that we were not capturing in the angular gyrus activity something that was actually delayed and could have occurred outside uh, the action selection window. So we stimulated the angular gy gyrus uh, at the coordinates found in fMRI, and the stimulation was applied at the onset of the target and the time of action selection before the button press, uh, at the point where people are selecting what response to make. And we found, so this is the no TMS condition, we found that TMS, applying TMS over the angular gyrus at the time of action selection abolishes the difference between, so in terms of agency ratings, abolishes the difference between compatible and incompatible trials, so abolishes the effect of selection fluency on sense of control. And in the second experiment, we applied this, uh, we applied the TMS at different uh, uh, time points and during the trial, so either at the onset of the target or at the onset of the button press, or at the onset of the color patch. And uh, we found that uh, when the stimulation, so this is the sham, no TMS condition, again, uh, when the stimulation is applied, is, is locked, locked to the onset of the, tar of the target, it abolishes uh, the, the, the effect of compatible priming on sense of control with a progressive return to baseline uh, as the stimulation is applied later on in the sequence, right? So uh, this, I think clearly suggests huh, that this effect of selection fluency on, on sense of control is limited to uh, early preparation and possibly execution phases uh, of action. So now just to briefly uh, recap, so we found this prospective influence of action selection over agency. This effect is truly prospective because it occurs before making the action and before knowing the consequences of action. Uh, this effect of selection fluency can be dissociated from a retrospective uh, judgment on uh, response times, and this effect is coded by a frontal parietal network through a parietal monitoring of prefrontal action selection signals. And all this really occurs at the time of action selection, as shown by early TMS stimulation of the angular gyrus uh, at the time of action selection, and so this uh, stimulation abolishes the effect of selection fluency on sense of control. 
So uh, now we may wonder uh, what could be the functional role of this interplay between selection fluency and sense of agency. And why would uh, fluency of action selection interact with sense of control the way it does? <laughs> and to answer this question, we can ha have a look at um, uh, what happens when these uh, action selection signals are abnormally processed by the brain, as this might be the case in uh, uh, patients suffering from, uh, so schizophrenic patients and suffering from uh, xenopathic Schneiderian symptoms of schizophrenia, so in patients uh, experiencing loss of control and severe loss of, loss of control over their own actions and thoughts. And it has been suggested and shown and that these patients, they excessively rely on external post hoc action cues uh, to either judge their own agency or to infer other people's intentions and to <coughs> make predictions about other people's uh, behavior. And uh, here we wanted to see whether this excessive reliance on external cues uh, might actually uh, compensate for a primary deficit in uh, monitoring uh, uh, these internal action selection signals. So we tested uh, 18 of these pa patients and 18 uh, comparison non-psychotic participants using exactly the same task uh, with compatible and incompatible trials. And we first found this behavioral uh, striking dissociation, striking behavioral dissociation with uh, in both groups, uh, a similar effect of selection fluency, of compatibility on response times. Uh, so both healthy subjects and patients are faster to respond to the target when they are compatibly primed, but no effect of uh, selection fluency on subjective agency in patients. Uh, so we can see that, that there is no difference in control ratings between compatible and incompatible trials in patients uh, with uh, schizophrenia. And this dissociation was also found at the neural level with, again, and so this is a replication of the first fMRI study, uh, uh, disfluency of action selection and recruiting the DLPFC bilaterally in both healthy and uh, patients. And a modulation of left and right angular gyrus activity by sense of control in healthy subjects but no, nothing in uh, schizophrenic patients. So no interaction between sense of control and uh, uh, compatible priming in patients uh, with schizophrenia. You can see that activity in their angular gyrus uh, remains completely flat uh, in both uh, compatible blue and incompatible conditions, uh, red. So um, dissociation between action selection mechanisms and subjective agency in patients. And now, when looking at the functional connectivity be between uh, DLPFC and angular gyrus. Uh, again, we found a strong increased connectivity between these two regions when selection was disfluent in healthy subjects, but nothing in patients uh, with uh, schizophrenia. So here the bars and they quantify the, the, the relationship and the, the, the information transfer between these two regions. And you can see that this relationship is close to zero in patients. So patients with uh, Schneiderian symptoms, they they seem, it seems that they do not benefit uh, from the prospective influence of selection fluency on a uh, sense of control. Uh, their agency is not informed by these objective signals of action selection. So to recap very briefly, in patients, uh, the level of motor performance seems to be spared. Subliminal priming of action works in patients, but the level where the, su the subjective experience of control is elaborated is uh, specifically impaired. Uh, and this might be due, or this is associated with a disconnection between frontal, uh, frontal and uh, parietal regions in a way that is consistent and with the functional disconnection hypothesis of schizophrenia, where one assumes that symptoms and cognitive impairments in this mental condition are not due to isolated deficits, but uh, to uh, abnormal communication uh, between brain areas, and this might be due to impaired uh, synaptic transmission. Okay, so I'd like to conclude uh, how much time do I have? Okay, okay, right. Okay, I'd like to conclude with some really quick thoughts about the role of these action selection signals in learning and in uh, motor expertise. So in the task, in the series of tasks I've shown so far, people don't have any real, they don't have a real instrumental control over the color patch. They just mistake fluency of action selection. They mistake the fluency with which they select their button press for real control over what appears on the screen as a result of this button press. 
And I'd like to suggest that if people, if fluency of action selection can be uh, mistaken for real control, it's precisely because, or it's maybe because, on average, fluency is a reliable, a good proxy for control over the environment. So when selection is fluent, and when I know what to do and how to do it, it's likely that I'll get the right outcome. So uh, fluency uh, uh, would be a good advanced predictor of control, a good advanced predictor of whether my action is going to be successful or not. And this one is for you, Stephen. Uh, and this is quite obvious in this nice quotation from Roger Federer. Federer. So it's in French. I'm going to translate it. When I perform a nice backhand stroke, it's fluent and effortless. And you know what? I know beforehand that the ball is going to, to fall inside the court. I do not even need to check. And this, this quotation suggests something very <coughs> interesting. It su suggests that, that the experience of fluency can somehow short circuit the process of checking the actual outcome, right? So it can somehow short circuit the process of comparing between predicted and observed consequences of action. So short circuit the, short circuit the comparator, the, the famous uh, classical comparator model. When I experience fluency during action preparation and execution, <coughs> it's likely that I'll get what I intended to get, and there is no need to, to check for the uh, actual consequence of my action. So fluency would be used as uh, to, or would be used to modulate how much attention one pays or needs to pay to the consequences of action. When uh, my backhand stroke is fluently selected and executed, huh, uh, it's likely that I'll get the ball inside the court, so I shouldn't waste my time and energy checking for the actual outcome. I should rather re reallocate my limited cognitive resources into more important tasks, such as uh, preparing the next move, for example. And of course, I should say that, that this uh, ability uh, to rely on fluency or to use fluency as a good uh, proxy for control probably requires some learning. It probably requires to first learn stable relations between actions and outcomes, and to first learn stable relations between uh, fluent back and stroke and, and having the ball inside the court. And it's likely uh, that this uh, fluency-based behavior uh, uh, only develops uh, after some time uh, with expertise with the brain shifting from uh, supervisory to automatic or expert uh, uh, control, as this may be the case in, uh, in professional athletes. And thank you. <laughs>